Right on. We just had a great conversation. Uh, when we get to the Q and A, we'll talk. We'll sort of bring up that line of, again. Is it like how did you turn pro? That's along that line. Okay. Sorry, we're having trouble keeping preview going. Not quite sure why. Me neither. Probably not. This is probably good right now, I think. View full screen. Hands off. Nobody touch it. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to go to the next slide. Okay, that was good. Uh, do you think we're good? Go ahead. <laughs> That's confidence right on. <laughs> okay, so from Mount Robson, in the tallest mountain in the Rockies to Mount McKinley, the tallest mountain in North America. I tell you, the, this sunrise at 12,500 feet on Mount McKinley is just beautiful. The sunrise, the, the low light, light, or the sunrise and sunset of the Arctic is out of this world. you, you got to check it out at one time, at least at some point in your life. Please do. So um, when I was young, dumb, and full of, mm, uh, you know, I used to do a lot of altitude climbing. And this is one of my trips where me and a couple of friends, uh, well, two out of three of us, one guy didn't make it. He made it. He just didn't make it to the summit. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we went to go climb Mount McKinley. And I, I've been climbing a lot at this point over just a couple of years, uh, about five, four or five. And uh, the Canadian Rockies is a great training ground for altitude climbing. Because if you get out there and climb in mountains in the winter at minus 80, when, you're, when your body's oxygen starved and having a hard time keeping the heat up, and you're at altitude, when it gets cold, like you know how to deal with it. And this is one reason why Canadians do so well at altitude around the world. When the shit is the fan, we can deal it. We can, we can survive, and we can deal with it. Uh, and we're equatorial countries that do mountaineering. When the, when the shit is the fan, like say on Everest, when there's a big storm or something, I got caught in a big storm on Burunse. Uh It's a 23 and a half thousand foot peak in the Himalaya. And then we were at 60, 500 meters, give or take, so about 21,000 feet, maybe 21 and a half. And basically what happened, we were right at Mount Everest, the jet stream hit the mountain and it sort of bent, you know, wave, or light waves bending when they refract around edges. The jet stream hit Mount Everest and it bent, came down and hit the mountain we were on. So we didn't get the full force of the jet, but it was, it was you know, probably 200 gusting 300 kilometers an hour. And the reason I feel confident of that estimate, uh, I grew up in Cape Breton, in Cape Breton, in Shetty Camp, where they get the select winds. Uh, they uh, forget what they call them on the weather network. But typically, they forecast 200, 260 kilometer an hour winds every year in, say, the Red Coast region of Newfoundland and, Cape, and northwestern Cape Breton, where I grew up. So when I was nine years old, I was out playing in those 100 an hour, mile an hour winds, having fun with me and my kids as we were getting blown around like rag dolls in the fields. Because <laughs> uh, the winds are so strong, they can really pick you up. Using that as a reference, we, when we had this storm hit us at 21,500 feet, uh, we, I figured the winds were between two gusting 300 kilometers an hour. And we lost our camp at altitude, and me and my partner we got out of there. I got a little bit of frostbite in my toes, but didn't lose any. And we survived. And that's because Canadians know how to deal with the cold. <laughs> and we can, we can live. We can survive. So this, at 12,500 feet in, on Mount McKinley on this scene, beautiful sunrise. You know, a lot of people, there is some, like, I, I say Americans, but I don't mean it in a derogatory way. They just don't experience the cold like we do, mostly. There, there are some people in this camp where we were, were having a hard time, but you know, my climbing buddies, we were like having coffee before we go to bed. I'm, I'm addicted to caffeine, by the way. Uh, we were having a coffee before we went to bed, just soaking it all in at minus 40, loving the sunset. It was great. And that really helps. Same camp next morning. We actually had took a rest day there during acclimatization. We were above the clouds for two weeks on Mount McKinley. It, it, we got so accustomed to this beautiful scene we stopped noticing it because we were down below in those clouds was just a terrible storm raging. Uh, around 12,000 feet, and hot, up to about 7,000 feet, there was nothing. And then there was right on the summit of Mount McKinley, there was another sort of just like a 
a, a white cap of wind and storm up high. We were in the sweet spot where it was really nice. So we acclimatized there. And luckily, we did eventually summit Mount McKinley. And it was great. The best view of North America, I must say from personal experiences, is from between my ankles as I'm standing on top of it on the summit of Mount McKinley. Great. Good feeling. Okay, let's get rid of that. I agree. We took the, the wooden comments. What's that? The wooden comments. It's a good thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, was that? Oh, I think that was Facebook. Yeah. Uh, uh, side left. This is on a ski traverse. This is one of the training things I did before I went to Mount McKinley. Me and some buddies, we skied 130 kilometers from Bugaboos to Rogers Pass along the spine of the surf, the Mount, the Selkirk Mountains. Uh, quite a mountainous area, heavily glaciated. We, you know, me and my friends, we do this for fun. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really hard work, and the consequences of a mistake in route finding are deadly, literally. Uh, but we do it for fun, because we see stuff like this. F8 and be there? Well, hell, I'm there for Doing, doing it every, well, not every day. I'm out there all the time, and it's great. So we'll shift gears a little bit to this past summer, and I went up to, I went up to the Arctic and the, the sea north of Inuvik, Tuktoyuktuk. So this is in northern BC, and we're, we're it's not on the Cassier Highway, but we're close to it. We're driving along, and I, we come to this beautiful view. We're above the mountains, and it was a grand landscape I was looking at but I zoomed in to this element down in the valley where the clouds were clearing on the trees. Uh, I still have some photos in mind that I want to get, those projects in the back of my head that I don't have them yet. This is getting close, but I can make a better shot of this. It looks much better with the contrast in this screen, but that's not bad there. Just think of that with a little more contrast, and it's better. Uh, I'll talk about night sky shooting, Aurora specifically. Uh, a lot of people. I get a lot of questions of that in business. I do private tours as well. Uh, yeah, this is no, no. Uh, so, my ballpark starting point for for land, for night sky photography. First of all, I'm using a, a camera that can go to ISO 6400 native, not interpolated. So, I start at ISO 3200. If you have an ISO 3200 camera, you're not really gonna get a good night aurora shot. It's, the ISO is just not sensitive enough. If you have an ISO 1600 cana, camera, you're not going to get a good night sky shot. You, you kind of need the, the prosumer or pro camera bodies to shoot good night sky stuff. Um, but starting set, the settings, um, <clears throat> and that has to do with the, you know, if you look at the settings, ISO 3200, 2 to 4 seconds, f2.8, you know, what, what does it matter what the sensor is? It does matter. It actually matters what your lens is, too. The resolution of the stars between an f4 lens and an f1.4 lens is night and day, pardon the pun. The, my f4, 20, my 24 mil f4 re resolves the sky so incredibly. It's almost impossible for me to take a bad picture of the night sky with that. But if I, if I shoot with a 2.8 lens, it's still pretty darn good. If you shoot with an f4 lens, it just doesn't work. You just can't catch the stars. I'm not sure the physics behind that honestly. So if we shot at, say, shutter speed 4 seconds at f4 with an f4 lens, but then you pick the same settings with an f1.4 lens, but set it to f4, the f1.4 lens would be significantly better than the f4 lens. Night, it's incredible. If you ha owned both of those lenses, uh, I, I'd like you to experiment. And actually, thank you. I just talked myself into my next blog post. I'll do a blog post on that. I do blog posts about stuff like that when I think of them. Uh, let's see if I remember it. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, your, your sensor. In the menus, you can set your camera sensor to high ISO sensitivity or the native sensitivity. If it's on the native, you're not going to be able to resolve the skies very well. You have to set your sensor to high sensitivity. Now, in your camera, in your manuals for your camera, it's going to say you're going to, you can increase noise. But when you don't have it set to high sensitivity, what the camera software does, it sees all those little stars, the faint ones, and it thinks it's hot pixels, and it tends to mask them out. 
I think that's what's going on. I'm pretty sure. Because some, some cameras are, have soft firmware that will recognize hot pixels and cancel them out. Well, those are the small stars in the night sky. Those, are, those look like hot pixels. So set your camera to high sensitivity. Your camera software won't cancel out those hot pixels or stars, and you'll get a better night sky photo. And also, one last thing, manual focus. You know, I've heard lots of great ways how to focus it on the night sky in the middle of the night out, outdoors. I can't do it very well. You know, it's hit and miss. Uh, you know, take a shot, zoom in with your LCD onto a star and see halos or whatever. When it's slightly out of focus, you'll get a halo. Or if there's a thin layer of cloud, you get a halo too. Um, what I do now, when I'm leaving Banff, the last street lights, I ought to focus on a distant street light. And then I take a piece of tape, an actual piece of hockey tape, and I'll tape the lens barrel in place, and then flip it to manual focus. And I'll leave it there for the night. And I'm shooting fixed focal length lens. That, that infinity focus will change if you zoom. So I'm shooting with my 24-1-4 fixed focal length, and I, that focus is set for the night. I'm in focus for the rest of the night. So that's how I do it, because then when I get out to say Lake Minnewanka or somewhere else, I'm going to have a hard time to focus and I'm probably not going to get it spot on like I can by focusing on a distant street light before I leave town. So that's a good little tip. Okay, and this is, uh, where did I take this one? This is Lake Minnewanka, actually. Aurora at Lake Minnewanka, just out from my home, not too far from my home. This is a very famous spot to shoot the Aurora. There's a pull-off right before the dam at Lake Minnewanka. There are some outhouse washrooms right there. And when there's an Aurora alert, you can't miss it because there's like 10 or 30 cars parked there. And there's all kinds of tripods set up. It's, it's a very popular spot for good reason. You get stuff like this. Uh, this one is taken this past summer in Tombstone Territorial, Territorial Park in Yukon. Uh, this is outside my tent in the campground. This is great. Like, you know, I was sleeping away. We just pulled up two days, two long days to get from Banff all the way up to the start of the Dempster Highway. It's about 85 kilometers down the Dempster Highway. Uh, that's a long ways to drive in two days. <laughs> and it was two, yeah, I think it was two days. But this is with my 2414 tripod outside my tent door. Kazu, she's just amazing. She loves the Aurora, and so she, she was out checking every night, which is great, because then I could sleep if it wasn't on. <laughs> she would wake me up if it was on. And then when she woke me up when I was on, I'd get up and I'd stay, stay up for another hour or so, or so, maybe longer, get some good shots, but she'd go back to sleep. <laughs> it, it, was a great, it was a great partnership. We have a great partnership. Uh, so this is what I got up in Tombstone. It's just absolutely amazing. Also this summer, I just, we went uh, climbing in, on the Valley of the Ten Peaks on the continent. So we're at an alpine club hut on the Continental Divide, literally on the Continental Divide. When you're on the balcony of the hut, in the middle of the night when you, you know, gotta go for a week, you get go to that side of the hut, it's BC, and that side of the hut, it's Alberta. So we're right on the, it's on a col between two mountains and 10 peaks. And the, the Milky Way was just beautiful. This is my 24 mil lens, 1.4, handheld. Handheld. I braced it against the railing of the, the Alpine Club cabin, but this is what you can get with this lens. Now, geez, like even five years ago, could you imagine hand holding and getting that? Even with bracing? Maybe 10 years ago? No, forget it. The, the, the ISOs and the cameras are getting so good. It's allowing us to get this stuff. And this is why everyone and his dog seems to be doing night sky photography nowadays. You know, the cameras can do it. It's great. The ISO you uh, that one. I, I'm going back from a, this is a shot in August. Uh, like if your hand's not holding it, I'm not yeah. holding it. Yeah, I, I'm guessing I was at 20, 2,000 or 20, I, I mean, 2,000 or 2,500. That's probably what I was shooting at. And I wasn't at f1.4, maybe at 2.8, maybe 2.8, maybe f4, somewhere in there. Um, about five, uh, night, or Canon 5D Mark III. Good, good camera, good entry level pro camera. Um, yeah, but yeah, that that's great. The Milky Way right over uh, Mount Allen to the left, and I forget the one street 
at the bottom of Milky Way. I'm like, that's not Alan. I forget what that is. Actually, that might be Perrin. That might be Alan. Okay. Oh, yeah, and just ice fields. That was an ice field below the mountain. You know, it's fun. We do this. My wife and I do this for fun. We get up in the Alpine. We F8 and be there. We're in the kind of the cool spots. We do this on a regular basis. And then I always have my camera with me. You know, I'm carrying 10 pounds of camera gear or more. And to get to that spot, actually, we had to climb a 5-7 route up a vertical cliff face uh, with huge packs for like three days of food, camping gear, well, sleeping bag, and, and my camera gear. Uh, to get stuff like this, you have to be a participant in the sport. You have to know how to do this stuff to really get that type of stuff. But there's not a lot of photographers do that. I'm sure we've all heard of Paul Zitka. He, he does it. He's becoming more and more of a technical climber. He was a scrambler for years, which is getting in the similar, the same areas of this where it wasn't technical. But now he's doing a bit of climbing too. He's most, yeah, he's, he's doing, he's coming along. Like he's in his mid thirties now. Uh, so he's, I started doing it about 10 years before him, but he's starting to do the technical climbing as well. F8 and be there, get up in the mountains. So we'll talk a little bit more about other places. So Japan. Like, I love Japan. My wife is Japanese. That's not why I married her. <laughs> I married her. Uh, but you want to hear a little side story? How are we doing for time? Well, it's getting, it's, it's getting on? Uh, okay, okay. Okay, basically, the first time I met Kazu, we were going to, on a climbing trip to the Bugaboos. I was arranging through the Alpine Club of Canada. I was leading it. And she showed up, she's pretty short, she's carrying a pack as big as mine that weighs about as much as her. That's an exaggeration. When I saw that girl, I thought, hmm, we could have a lot of fun together because I'm always out in the mountains. You know, I, don't, I was never one to hang out in the bars very much. I was always out climbing. And uh, one, of my, one of my cheesy litmus tests for girlfriends was, can she carry a heavy pack? And honestly, if she couldn't carry a heavy pack, we weren't going to have fun together because I was out in the mountains all the time. <laughs> so she, she loved that. We, we got off great. And now we're, we're going to Japan quite frequently to visit family and do some photography tours occasionally. <clears throat> Kyoto is beautiful, especially in the spring during the cherry blossoms. You see stuff like this in, a, in an alley. This is a Maiko, not a geisha. She's an apprentice geisha, Maiko. They tend to have more colorful clothing. And she's just pulling the umbrella down. And I just asked her to pause. Normally they don't do that, but she did. It was great. Golden temples, literally. That temple is coated in solid gold. It's nuts, like in Japan. Like Kyoto is incredible. And the snow monkeys. I shot this at 14 millimeter. Look at the distortion in his hand. Look at the proportion. It's his head and his hand. Look at that. Um, I'm about 18 inches from that monkey's hand shooting. One time, one of the younger juvenile monkeys ran in front along the wall right between these monkeys and me, right about when I was shooting this, and he rubbed the front of my lens element and had to go clean the water off her. Like, this is crazy. You can only do this in a few spots. Uh, you can only do this in a few spots in, uh, in Japan. Uh, monkeys are everywhere, but they tend to keep their distance from people. They, they, it's kind of like a, a feral dog pack in the city. You know, they, they kind of pack, they, they cause trouble. But here, at this park, close to Nagano, they feed them. They feed them grain. And they hang out in this hot spring. Like, this doesn't happen everywhere in Japan, but it happens here. And because they're fed, they figured out they're smart, they put up at the tourists with the cameras, and that big guy standing out of the frame to the left there with the big stick, literally, he has a big stick, and he's a big Japanese guy, he feeds them grain. If any of them steps out of line, he comes talk to them with a stick. And that's, the monkeys have figured out this balance between humans. And this is typical to Japan. There's no wilderness, and there's, and there's lots of urban, but the wilderness and the animals have learned to live with people. People are part of the landscape in Japan. You'll see that in their houses in the countryside. Everything 
including humans, evolved together there over many, well, centuries. Let's talk even bigger than centuries. Let's millennial, like, yeah, basically human culture kind of developed around there in Africa and that sort of thing. The landscape has evolved with the people, and the people are part of the landscape in Japan. So monkeys close to people is just normal. Often they don't get along good like we are here, but, but we do sometimes. Again, look at this. Portraiture work, that line, that line. Through the eyes, through the eyes. We practice that in portraiture, don't we? 